Okay, perfect. Okay, hello back everybody. It's very nice that you are still here and we are excited for the last talk of the conference. Unfortunately, it has been really great. Uh, the next speaker is Carlos Cardoya. I, would, I must say that he is the best in, type of, in all types of complexity results. And it's very nice that he's working, he's extending those, uh, his extensive knowledge in approximation algorithms in representation of problems within the context of decision diagrams. So Carlos did his PhD at TU Berlin. Then he worked for several years at IBM Research in Brazil. And now he's a faculty at the Department of Operations and Information Management at the University of Connecticut. So it's a great pleasure to have you here, Carlos. Please enlighten us with your amazing theoretical knowledge. Cool. Thank you very much for the very nice introduction, Andre. Of course, everything Andre said is a lie. I'm, I'm not that good, but yeah, let's. That's cool. So, uh, well, thanks everybody. So this event was quite, quite nice. So thanks and congrats to Andre and David for organizing this. I hope we'll have the chance of having more events like that in the, in the near future, hopefully in person, not only online. And this is joint work with my wonderful collaborators, David Bergman, Mur Bodor and Andre Sire. And well, I will kind of move a little bit slowly in, in this talk. Um, maybe I will be way too slow, but let's see, let's play by ear. I'm going to start giving a very brief introduction about multi-objective optimization. So uh, I have the, the impression there, there are more Brazilians in this, uh, in the, in this session than, than I was anticipating, but well, let's, so the example will make sense to, to them as well. So this is actually a, an example that uh, is normal to everybody's life. So sometimes you, you want to fly to one place to the other. Well, not so much these days because of COVID, but back in the day, we were doing this quite a lot. And usually uh, in most cases, we have to, uh, we always have to see what we want to prioritize when, when looking for tickets, right? So in this example, well, uh, this is from Sao Paulo to Rio, two cities in Brazil. They are not so far from, from each other. But still, there are many possibilities, many different types of connections. And every time that you are picking a flight ticket, you basically have two main uh, criteria, right? The first one is price, and the second one is the duration of the flight. Well, in some cases, you were lucky enough to have an option like the one that you see in the middle. So this is the option that is taking, uh, taking you the fastest uh, from Sao Paulo to Rio and for the, for the cheapest price. So that's basically the best of the worst. However, in some cases, and those of you who had the, the experience of uh, booking tickets in the past know that this is actually not what we see in most of the cases. Usually you have to, to find a balance. So for instance, if we take a look at the option, at the leftmost option, we could get from Sao Paulo to Rio in, in eight hours, uh, which is actually much better than what it would do in the third option, which would take you 24, uh, 25 hours but then it would need to pay three times more. So the, the main message here is the following. Well, uh, it's actually not unusual to have different uh, optimization criteria when it comes to, to decision-making. And in a very few cases, we have a, a clear uh, winner. We have a clear better option, but that's not always the case. And this would be the case here in this particular example, if we had only the first and the third option that show up here in the slide. So let me go to another example. And this is more, those of you who, are, who have a more of an OM background who probably recognize this as the assortment planning problem with inventory constraints. So here we have a problem where we consider a store that has uh, four different products. And the store uh, wishes to build a catalog. This should decide when, on which project uh, products it should show to, to the customers. In a way, uh, it would make sense to uh, just show all the products, right? Because then uh, it, you could eventually capture more more demand, so to say. But again, those of you who are familiar with the assortment planning literature will probably know that, well, in, even in cases where you have enough space to show everything, that does not necessarily give you the, the very best uh, uh, strategy. And here we do have an issue with uh, shelf capacity. So here I'm going to assume that we have a restriction uh, on the shelf capacity. So I'm going to assume that each item uh, that the store can offer has a certain utility. So that's the, the, how the customers value the, the, uh, the product that, that is being offered and also a certain weight or length, 
uh, whatever. It basically uh, represents the, the space that this uh, particular item is, is occupying. And well, uh, actually, I'm pretty sure that at this point, everybody here in this talk is uh, uh, an expert in decision diagrams, and you probably solve MEPSEC problems a lot in your life. If you haven't, that only means that you are uh, young, you will see a lot in your career for sure. And well, what we have here, in, if we just take into account a single objective, if we assume that all the utilities are the same, then we basically have the traditional knapsack problem. And this is actually uh, yeah, a business as usual type of problem, right? We, it's NP hard, it's weekly NP hard, but still we know how to solve them very well. So bottom line, no one is afraid of knapsack problems uh, you know, these days. However, uh, the truth is that, well, the, the nice thing about this example is that it's very easy to see that this uh, description that I gave is not really precise, right? So uh, in, in many, case, many cases, we do have a market segmentation. So that basically means that certain customers give, the, give a certain utility to an item, but then when you go to another segment in the market, the utility that assigned to the same uh, item to the same product will be different. And here in, in our example, I'm basically dividing this by, by age, right? So some customers that are younger than 18, they have a certain utility and customers that are older than 18, they have a different utility. And just by quickly inspecting the, the vectors here, you can see that uh, there are some differences that will actually make our life slightly more complicated. So then what we have in the end is the following. Uh, we have the same problem. We still have the NAPSEC uh, constraint, as you can see, we still have a binary uh, problem. We either want to pick a certain item or not. But now we have two different uh, optimization functions to optimize over. And the bad news is, is that those objective functions are actually conflicting. So you see, for instance, that for the, for the first group, item number four is very attractive, whereas for the second group, item number three is more, is more interesting. So yeah, well, everybody here in this presentation is much smarter than me. Probably you know already how to solve this problem just by looking at it, because the problem is small. But still, it should be clear that in this particular case, the we have conflicting objectives. So the decision-making process here is slightly more complicated. So if we go ahead and plot all of the possible solutions that we have for this particular problem, this is the, the plot that we'll get, okay? So in the y-axis, you see the utility for the solution for people who are older than 18, and in the x-axis, the, the same utility, but for people that are younger than 18. Well, if you take a look into that, and I come to you and I offer this particular solution, it should be clear that this is very bad, right? So we are getting a certain utility for uh, certain utility for both uh, categories, for both segments. But you can see that in most, in almost all the other points, you would be better off, right? You would be uh, obtaining more utility for both groups. So it's too clear. It's clear that this point is way too low. That this point is dominated by other solutions that we have uh, in the problem. And, and by no dominated here, I mean you can find other solutions that improve over both uh, objective functions uh, and, and therefore it makes this uh, particular choice not uh, rational from the economical perspective. On the other hand, if I take a look now at those two points uh, presented here uh, in the slides, you will see that now there is no clear dominance, right? So if more precisely, uh, the point on the right it's actually better for uh, for older people, for younger people, uh, so to say. But this is not, but it's not as nice for people who are older. So the thing is, if you want to improve for one specific group, you have to make things worse for the other group. So it's clear that here, this is the point where we are not talking. Uh, the decision-making process here is not about math anymore, but it's more about uh, about preferences, much about the taste whatever the maker wants to accomplish. Incorporating an aspect that is uh, uh, explicitly formulated in the problem. And this is the same for all the points that I'm presenting here. And well, uh, we have a uh, fancy uh, for that. So the set of solutions, the set of points that are not dominated by any other points uh, in, in the space of feasible solutions is referred to as the Pareto frontier of our problem. 
So when I talk about Pareto frontier or non-dominated solutions, I'm talking about the same thing. Okay. I hope this is clear. Again, uh, even if you are not super familiar with multi-objective uh, optimization, I think that the concepts are more or less easy to follow. But of course, if you have questions, feel free to, to stop me. Cool. And uh, now that we have the, the problem that we uh, and the thing that we have here, uh, the first thing is, well, it actually makes a lot of sense to to consider uh, multi-objective problems because uh, the real problems that we have in life they have uh, multi-objective aspects all around. However, uh, unfortunately, when we take a look at the problems from a computational perspective, from a, a complexity perspective, we see that things are actually quite nasty. So for instance, I'm providing here a few examples of problems that we all know very well how to solve uh, in the single objective setting. So we have uh, efficient algorithms. We even have combinatorial algorithms for, for all the, the, the problems that, I, that I'm showing up here. But uh, when you extend this problem to the bio-objective setting, if you assume that you have at least two objective functions to optimize over for these problems, then things get hard already. So that those problems are already in the heart. And finally, well, I, told, I just mentioned the, the Pareto frontier. And the bad thing here is that not only those problems are hard, but the Pareto frontier may actually be exponentially large. And this is not only a problem from the computational perspective, so it's clear if the Pareto frontier can be exponentially large, there's no way you can come up with a polynomial, uh, with a polynomial algorithm to solve the problem. But it's also a problem from a more pragmatic perspective, right? So the, the thing is, if you give an exponentially large number of solutions to the decision maker, okay, so what, what do you actually expect her to do? Uh, of course, uh, the, the fact that the problem is that this problem has this, uh, this issue does, doesn't really mean that, okay, so multi-objective uh, optimization is not useful in practice. That, that's quite the opposite. But for instance, the last question is, a, uh, is an interesting one. There's no clear answer to that. I mean, this is a very fair critique, so to say. But maybe there may be one reason why we don't have a satisfactory approach to address this, uh, this issue. And again, that's a mathematical issue. Uh, there's nothing we can do about that. Is that, well, the problems are so hard to solve that people just didn't put enough time to think about that. So again, I don't really know how to address this problem. Uh, I don't know how to make this uh, exponentially large uh, issue disappear. But again, this is probably something that some smart people should think about. In any case, if you were not really paying attention to what I said so far, I totally understand you, but the important message here is the following. I'm going to work, I'm going to present a work uh, where we use decision diagrams or network models, which is pretty much a version of decision diagrams, to solve multi-objective discrete uh, optimization problems. And the important message here that I want you to understand at this point is that those problems are hard, hard in the computational sense, okay? Cool. Uh, well, as we all know here, uh, showing that a problem is hard doesn't make the problem disappear, especially in practice, right? So of course, people will have to solve uh, hard problems somehow. And actually, when we think about multi-objective problems, again, the, the example that I gave is a concrete example, right? So we actually see those problems all the time. So there are two clear direct ways of approaching multi-objective optimization. So the first one, uh, consists of replacing the multi-objective expression for a single objective problem. And basically the way to do that is by assigning different weights to the different objectives, okay? So there is a, so this technique uh, is actually, it's, it's, it's actually convenient, uh, so to say. Of course, it's always very, very hard to define those, those weights. So this is where the, this is what makes the, the, the use of this kind of approach uh, more complicated from, from the practical standpoint. But in any case, at least it allows us to find the so-called family of supported efficient points. So if you can find an efficient point, I mean a point that belongs to the Pareto frontier, using this approach, we refer to it as a supported efficient point. However, well, uh, someone here may correct me if I'm wrong, for, multi, for discrete multi-objective problems, using uh, scalarization will not always give you uh, all the points in the Pareto frontier. 
And in order to find those other points, uh, people use a different approach, which is pretty much the next natural approach uh, to solve multi-objective optimization problems, which basically consists of fixing one uh, objective function as your actual objective function. So again, you are working on a single objective optimization problem, because that's what we know how to solve, right? And we set all the other objectives as constraints in the problem. So you set the parameters and you want to solve one single objective uh, optimization problem under a, uh, subject to a few uh, additional constraints. And this uh, approach actually, for instance, in the example that I gave about the flight tickets, this is probably the most appropriate approach, right? Uh, even though we have to value our time, we have to set uh, financial values to, to our time, it's hard to do that in practice, right? So on that particular case, in the flight tickets uh, example, usually you would set, for instance, a limit, uh, a constraint on the number of hours that you want to, to spend uh, on, on your flight, and then you would try to minimize the cost, right? So this is what most people do. So bottom line, so what's the, the message here? Multi-objective optimization is not a solved problem. And by that, I mean, it's not like, uh, there's no simplex algorithm for the multi-objective optimization that solves everything as it does for the for linear programming. Okay, so what we do see in the literature, and again, sorry, so someone works on the area and, and, and disagree, but in, in most cases, what we do see is that most of the, the approaches, most of the algorithms that have been proposed, they focus only on problems with two or three uh, objective functions. So we do have uh, scalability issues in terms of the number of objective functions. And what happens in the end is that in many cases, people actually try to, to come up with tailored algorithms for specific problems. And one problem that's supposed to be the big star in this area is the knapsack problem. And we are actually going to do some, some work. I'm going to show some experiments on the knapsack problem as well. Well, I definitely don't have enough time to cover the literature. Again, multi-objective optimization is a huge area. And some people here in this, uh, uh, in this meeting probably know this area much better than me. The important thing is the following. So as the baseline, what we are going to use as the baseline to compare our proposed approaches, we are going to, uh, we're, uh, those are algorithms based on the criterion space search which basically use the two methods that, I, that I've mentioned before to, to find the point. There's also a decision space uh, search, and I'm not going to talk at all uh, about that. And our approach is more closely related to dynamic programming. So yeah, again, at, at this point, it should be very clear to everybody that uh, the decision diagrams, it's pretty much dynamic programming going on, right? And what we are doing here is pretty much a, a kind of an implementation of dynamic programming as well, a smart way of representing space and things like that. Cool. So the summary of our contributions here, we try to come up with a, a methodology based on decision diagrams or network models, it's uh, for the same thing, where we want to enumerate, uh, enumerate the labels of the Pareto frontier. So this is actually important. By label here, I just mean the value in the, um, uh, the objective value of the solution. So we are not going to store the solutions itself. Uh, this is actually a, an, important, uh, an important thing. It's possible, I will mention quickly that, that it's possible for us also to retrieve the solution associated with, uh, with a specific label, but our method itself is not going to focus on that. And one important thing, the reason why our method uh, works well uh, compared to the state of the art, is that we are able to, uh, we scale much better in terms of the number of objective functions. As you will see actually for our methods, the number of objective functions is not really important. And this is not the case for uh, other works in the, in the literature. Cool, so I will give a very brief uh, summary here of what we want to do. So first, well, Again, decision diagrams, uh, network models, it's clear that we are going to work on problems that admit recursive formulations. And good news is, well, even though we are uh, restricting a little bit uh, the set of problems that we can solve, good news is that I'm not uh, restricting things to linearity at all. So in, um, more precisely, we are going to be able to solve problems that have a non-linear objective, objective function as well. Okay, 
as I've mentioned before, we don't really care about the number of objective functions. Of course, in practice, uh, having more objective functions make the problem slightly harder, uh, but that's more because of uh, memory and not because of the technique itself. And as I said, we are looking at, at labels, so at the points in the objective space. And yeah, as I said, we can reconstruct these points eventually if we, if we want, but uh, we are not really investigating that so much in this, uh, in this work. And finally, a few technical uh, assumptions that I'm making, but they are more for just for convenience in, in presentation. So first we are considering only binary optimization problems, but uh, it's important to mention that the same ideas apply even in, when you have integer problems. And in particular, I'm going to show uh, in the end of this, uh, this talk some results that we have for the TSP. We use a, an integer formulation for the, for the TSP. So again, this is not only for binary optimization problems. And finally, it should be clear that this is a very mild assumption. We are just assuming that all the objective functions are maximization functions. Okay, should be easy to see that uh, flipping from minimization to maximization is actually uh, it's actually easy. And if you if you want to stop paying attention now and uh, do something else, the important message is the very last thing that shows up in this slide. So basically, we are doing that by representing the the, the multi objective objective problem as a network model as a kind of decision diagram, and we want to enumerate the Pareto frontier using the criteria shortest path algorithms. Okay, so. And the nice thing is that, well, there are a lot of people working on multi-objective shortest path algorithms. So uh, whatever they do in terms of progressing uh, in this area, it, it will only help us because it, it will only make our methods uh, better. Cool. So basically we have two different uh, techniques here to, to construct those uh, decision diagrams, but they basically have the same kind of structure. So. First, we design a recursive formulation for the problem. And by a recursive formulation, I'm basically talking about states and state transitions, okay? Once you have this representation, it should be clear that you have a graph behind the curtains, right? And we want this graph to be such that each path in the graph will be associated with a solution and vice versa, okay? At least in the very first stage, when we are building the diagrams, when we are building the network models, we want to make sure that we have this one-to-one -one relationship. And finally, as I've mentioned before, once you have this graph, once we have this structure, it all boils down to solving a multi-objective for this path. Cool. I will try to be very gentle in terms of notation, because again, it's the last talk, and probably you, you know those things, you have seen similar notations uh, quite a lot this week. So we basically still have, uh, the name of the structure here is network model, but again, if you understand decision diagrams, things are pretty much the same. So we still have a layer of cyclic multi-digraph. Uh, we have uh, a root node and a terminal node, so the, which belong to the first and the last layer of the, of the network, respectively. And the important thing here, this is maybe slightly different from what is called in the decision uh, diagrams uh, literature, is that our arcs here, the arcs that connects uh, nodes in, in different layers, they have a certain weight, okay? And in our case, we want to represent solutions also as a path between the root node and the terminal node. And we want the wave of this, we define the wave of this path as the sum of the waves associated with uh, each arc. And our goal is to find the Pareto frontier of, of the problem, which will basically be the Pareto frontier of this network, which is defined as the, as the sets of non-dominated uh, waves of the arcs. Okay, so you basically compute the, the weights of all the paths. Once you have those weights, again, remember that these will be a, uh, each uh, final weight will be a k-dimensional uh, vector. And we basically take all those possible vectors and we take the set of non-dominating points. Okay, this is our Pareto frontier. And it should be clear that, well, then we can just make the one-to-one the -one relationship because again, we are associating each uh, path with each solution in our original problem, okay? So this is, this is the, the core idea, this is the core modeling idea behind the curtains here. Cool, so there are, uh, we actually show two ways of building uh, the, the, uh, the network models. And the first one is based on, uh, on, on decision diagrams. So this was first done by David and Andre in 2016. So actually the work that I'm presenting extends this, uh, this paper by, by them. 
And uh, the idea here is actually very simple. So the main difference between decision diagram variants and network models is the following. First, in decision diagrams, you usually have no arc weights, right? And second, in the decision diagrams, you we usually have an arc domain associated with uh, each arc. So basically what we are doing is just, okay, we take a decision diagram, we get rid of the, the arc domains, and we incorporate arc weights to the, um, to the structure, and then we get, uh, we get a network. Again, let me repeat this again. I know that I'm repeating this for the third or fourth, fourth time already, but this is important. At the beginning, we will have a structure that represents all the solutions, but then I'm going to show a few transformations that we do in the network in order to make this network more compact. This will be great because this will help us computationally, but then we will actually lose information about the solution vectors, okay? So good. Uh, well, just to give an example on how to make the transformation uh, from decision diagrams. Well, again, we have here the same uh, knapsack problem that we saw before. And the one decision diagram representation of the knapsack problem is actually simple, right? So you have the states uh, being uh, associated with the, the weights that have been reached so far for, for the knapsack. And then for decisions basically represent whether you're picking a certain item or not. So, well, again, I, I'm pretty sure that you saw this decision diagram several times in this um, in this uh, winter school, but well, this would be, for instance, the, the decision diagram for this particular uh, knapsack problem. So good. Once you have this, uh, this first representation, well, here uh, with the decision diagram representation, I have all the information about, uh, about feasibility, right? So this is uh, an exact uh, representation of the, of the problem. So once you have that, the very first thing you do is to get rid of the information about the states. You keep the structure. You will still have the same set of nodes and the same set of arcs, but you remove the, the states, or at least you remove the labels associated with the, the states. And then what you do next, again, we want to compute a shortest path problem. So we are going to set the, the states now as the, as the partial weight of those paths. So what I'm doing here in this, uh, in this first step is to incorporate the, the first objective function. And as you can see, for instance, for the, the first item, the impact will be in the, for the first uh, objective of four. So this is why I have a four here. And of course, if I don't include X1, the impact will, uh, will be zero. And so it's pretty much the same thing. And as you can see, the arc weight, uh, weight here is the cost. This is the cost that shows up as the coefficients in the objective function. So again, this, you need this uh, recursive uh, decomposition. And again, if the, your problem has this additive uh, feature, as we have, for instance, in the network problem, uh, the construction should be clear. And well, this is the, the network that I have for one, uh, for just one objective. And I guess you guessed correctly already that in order to finalize my construction, all I have to do is to incorporate the, the objectives, the elements for, for, the second, uh, uh, for the second objective. And it should be clear also that if I had more uh, objective functions, things wouldn't change at all. The structure of my network model would be pretty much the same. Of course, my state would increase. The number of elements that I would have in each node would increase, the, that's clear. But the number of nodes and the number of hearts would remain the same, okay? At least at this point where we are not changing, we are not touching the, the, the network model yet. So, well, once you have this, uh, this structure, you can compute uh, the, the shortest paths uh, here, but we are maximizing, so we are computing the, the longest paths. And once you compute all the paths uh, associated with uh, all, uh, the, all the weights associated with all the, the paths, well, it's easy to find the set of non-dominated points. And this is what we have here, okay? Finally, the second, the, the other uh, transformation that we show, it's actually uh, quite similar. So if you understood for decision diagrams, you should be able to understand this one as well. We take a recursive formulation of the problem, and then we just represent, uh, based on this recursive formulation, we create a network model uh, representation of the same problem. So, and here by a recursive formulation, well, here we are, it's pretty much a, a terminology thing. It's pretty much the same thing as we had with decision diagrams. You have a state transition graph where you are representing uh, all the states in your system. You have a certain arc that uh, connecting a, connecting a pair of uh, states, if there is some action that you can take that will take you from the first to, to the second node. 
and of course for each um, for each transition you will have a certain reward function so probably those of you who are more familiar with uh, Markovian decision process and this kind of stuff for you it might be easier to understand this kind of formulation but again essentially we have pretty much the same thing that we had before with decision diagrams well I'm not going to show the whole thing here but just to make sure that this uh, recursive formulation is not scaring anyone this is the recursive formulation that we have, for instance, for uh, a setbacking problem, right? So we basically have a state representing whether the constraints are being satisfied or not. So it's basically an indicator of whether the, the constraint is binding or not, given the, the current solution. And once you have uh, this particular representation, business as usual, you just remove all the, the states and it repeats the same procedure that I just described for the NAPSEC problem. So again, two different ways of building uh, network models based on different representations on, on, uh, of the original problem. But again, essentially they are pretty much the same. Cool. Uh, this is a good point to see if someone has any questions. So, so far all, everything that we saw is how to construct the, the network models. So if anyone has any questions, this would be a good point. Yep. Sorry, we are good. No, no questions. Perfect. Perfect. Cool. So let me go on. So, okay. At this point, uh, I'm going to assume that we have now a network model, okay? An exact network model. So we have an exact representation. If we solve the problem using, uh, using this uh, network model, we can get the Pareto frontier. And in addition to that, it's easy for us to also get the solution associated with each, uh, with each label, which is actually great. However, the thing is, well, we saw already uh, several times in this, in this school that, well, just like uh, decision diagrams, network models can go very large, very quickly. So what we are going to do is to present a set of validity preserving operations, which are basically operations that we, use, that we apply over the network models that will allow us to reduce the network, network model while preserving the Pareto frontier, okay? So that, this is actually very good news because, well, if you reduce the network models, it's clear that the algorithms will run faster. However, on the negative side, in order to do that uh, by incorporating, so by applying some of these operations, we may eventually include infeasible paths or we may eventually exclude feasible paths. So again, we don't have a, an explicit representation of the solution. Of course, if you bookkeep all the transformations, all the operations that you have applied, you can always go back, once you have a, a favorite label in your Pareto frontier, you can always go back to the original network, restore the original network and get the, the solution back. But again, this is not going to be our focus here. And we considered in, in this, uh, in this work, uh, three types of operations. So the first one is, uh, is the so-called arc removal, and this is actually very simple. So let's suppose that we have a pair of uh, a pair of nodes. Let's suppose that we have two or more arcs connecting those nodes. Well, if I have one of these arcs completely dominating the other, and remembering that I want to maximize over all the objective functions, it should be clear that, for instance, if I take a look at this uh, specific connection it never makes sense for me to reverse uh, the arc that has uh, uh, weights zero and zero, right? So I can get more utility from the other arc where I get weights one and three. Same thing for the arc for the, for the last arc here, connecting the, the terminal. It doesn't make sense for me to take the path, any path going through zero, zero, if I can always go through eight, three, okay? So what we are doing is the following. Uh, Whenever we have situations like that, where we have a pair of arcs connecting the same pair of uh, nodes and where one of the arcs completely dominates the other, we can just go ahead and remove those guys, okay? Uh, we can show, and we actually show this in the, um, in the paper, that deciding whether there is an arc that you can remove or not and removing without uh, losing all the elements in the Pareto frontier is actually NP-hard. Okay, so of course, this, uh, the, these examples that I gave are, are, are simple, they are kind of obvious, but if you want to do this in a more generic setting, the problem gets hard. Cool, the other operation actually is, uh, by itself is not super exciting, but it will be combined with another one that will make it more interesting. So this is the so-called weight shifting operation. 
And this is actually simple. So if I have, for instance, one specific arc, like this one here, UT, that has weights eight and three, one thing that I can do is to basically push this, uh, these weights to the arcs that are arriving at U. So I basically add this utility. I basically add this weight to all the arcs that are uh, arriving at U. And if I do that, well, then I can just go ahead and replace this arc here, the weight to zero. And this is what I'm doing here. It should be more or less clear that if I do that, I'm not going to change anything in terms of the Pareto frontier. However, it should be clear already that if I do that, I will start to incorporate weird solutions when I look in the, in the solution space, right? So the solutions that I'm getting now, it, it, it starts to get weird to, to understand well what's going on in terms of the solution. So again, I'm doing something that will preserve the Pareto frontier, but will eliminate, it will make our solution uh, look strange. But good, well, again, uh, the goal of the VPOs is to reduce the, the network. And it's obvious that I haven't reduced anything here, right? But again, this operation uh, gets more interesting when we combine with node merging. And node merging, well, as you can see, there's a big statement there, but the, the operation is actually simple. So let's suppose that we have two different nodes in the same layer and that they are connected to the same set of nodes in the, in the, in the next layer. And all those connections have exactly the same weight. Well, in this case, it should be clear that I can merge those two nodes, right? Uh, if I merge those two nodes, I will preserve all the paths that I have. So the Pareto frontier won't be affected by, by this operation. And I will get uh, rid of uh, one of the nodes. Again, this operation also screws up with the decision uh, space, but it doesn't do anything. It doesn't do any harm in my objective space. Okay. Finally, this is just uh, another example where I'm doing again the weight shift operation here. So I have these two integers. I just bring it up, and then once I have those those guys uh, increasing, both two guys equal to zero, I can merge those two nodes. So yeah, that's basically that. Not really sophisticated or complicated, but as we are going to see, quite powerful. So good. At this point, we saw how to construct uh, a network model. Then we saw how to reduce this network model. Perfect. Now the very last thing that we have to do is to finally compute the Pareto frontier. Okay. This here, I do have a very uh, important disclaimer. Actually, we are not really proposing anything new here. So in a way, what we are doing, uh, at least in this uh, specific step of the, of the solution method, is pretty similar to what some other people have done before in the, in the literature. So yeah, I mean, it's not exactly equal. People have not studied exactly this kind of uh, construction before, but the, the ideas are, are somehow similar. So first, uh, well, the, the most basic ones are the so-called unidirectional compilations. And yeah, you, and you basically have two approaches, either bottom-up or top-down. And well, this basically uh, boils down to computing the shortest path, either starting at the root node or starting at the terminal node, okay? So business as usual, nothing really complicated here. One thing that I do want to catch your attention though is the following. As you can see, so the red nodes are top down, right? So we start here and then we go down. And as we go down, you can see that the number of solutions that show up increases quite a lot, right? And again, remember the results that I've mentioned uh, at the beginning. The size of the Pareto frontier can be exponential in, in the size of the problem. So one problem that we have here is the following. Okay, so the number of... Uh, the number of objective functions is not really affecting our construction at all. But of course, the set of labels, the number of labels that we are representing in, in the network, these eventually becomes a problem, should be clear, right? So we have to handle a lot of elements. This requires uh, space and this requires time. So based on, uh, on this ob observation, so the, a natural idea is to actually come up with something that we refer to as the bidirectional compilation. So instead of just computing uh, in, in one direction, we kind of try to compute from both, from, from both directions at the same time. And we basically rely on, at the end on a coupling operation. So you can basically think that we are going from, from the top to down. We, we, we construct uh, in one direction and then we also go bottom up. And then at some point, those guys have to merge. So here, 
when we use a bidirectional compilation, the Pareto frontier will not be at the root nodes or at the terminal nodes as we had in the unidirectional compilation. This will be somehow in the middle, right? And we can all, uh, we can actually show, and this, uh, has, again, this, this kind of result has appeared uh, before in the multi-objective literature, that we can do this efficiently. So doing this coupling operations is not really really hard. So the way we did uh, was the following. Well, we basically uh, proceed with the top-down and the bottom-up approach uh, simultaneously. And we always pick uh, the layer to uh, expand over that has the minimum number of uh, the minimum number of layers. Min, uh, yeah, the minimum number of labels. So we basically count how many labels, how many labels we have in all the nodes in a certain uh, in a certain layer, and the one that has a, uh, the smallest we we expand over. And we basically stop, of course, when both uh, when both sides meet each other. And here, for those of you who are looking for open problems, I do have two to mention to you. So. When we were working on this uh, on this problem, well, our uh, approach is heuristic, right? So, in the end, we are doing this bidirectional compilation because we want to minimize the number of uh, labels that will be represented in, in the network model. But it's not really clear how you can determine the best layer to couple on, especially beforehand, right? So, of course, if you have already the the network, then it's clear it's uh, it's trivial uh, how to do that. But of course, if you don't know, if you don't have this construction beforehand, then how can you actually compute that, right? How, how, how can you predict that? So at the time we had this discussion, it was even hard to, uh, to describe this problem from an optimization perspective. But now when I was uh, working on this, uh, this presentation for this uh, workshop, it came to my mind that maybe it's possible to show that this problem is sharp P complete. So sharp P is that, Kind of uh, computational complexity class that we show that we see every few months and we we read and forget, right? Sharp P is basically the class that uh, of problems where we want to count the number of solutions that satisfy a specific property. Okay, and my guess is that it's possible to show that this problem, that this uh, this first problem that I'm alluding to here, is Sharp P complete. I don't have really, I didn't put enough time to to think about that, but again, if someone wants to brainstorm about it, let me know. And finally, well, uh, our approach, we go layer by layer, right? Another approach that we eventually discuss as well is to actually go node by node. And you can do that. Uh, the problem is that it gets trickier for, for the coupling operations, and it also gets trickier in terms of representation. So this is probably, this could probably be more efficient to say in terms of uh, minimizing the number of labels. But our guess at the time was that from the computational perspective, it wouldn't really make sense to implement that. This wouldn't be more efficient than just solving layer by layer. Cool. Uh, so let me go to the final step here. Let me show you some numerical experiments uh, on those algorithms. So, well, as you can see, basic uh, experimental setup. Super important, especially for the young people out there. When you do this kind of thing, you should always use a single core. You should never use all the cores in your PC. Of course, things will run faster if you have more cores, but it's way harder to compare uh, with, uh, with previous, uh, previous work. And it will make harder for others to compare with your results. So always use single core executions, and that's what we did here. As he says as well, we are solving the knapsack problem, again, because that's pretty much the standard benchmark in multi-objective optimization. We also solved some set covering setback, setbacking problems. And in addition to that, I'm also going to show quickly some results about the TSP. Again, this is an, an example where the problem is not binary. This is an integer optimization problem. And finally, I'm also going to show a problem that is non-linear. Okay? As the algorithms. So we are comparing against uh, three uh, state-of-the-art algorithms in, uh, in the area. And we do have uh, a few different versions of the network model-based algorithms. One thing that I didn't mention is label filtering. So label filtering, uh, it's clear that once you have a set of labels associated with a node, if one node is dominating the other, well, we can eliminate that node uh, immediately, right? But in some cases, you can be slightly smarter. In some cases, you can see that, okay, if I have this particular label in this node and this other label in this node, and I have some dominance uh, relationship, I can actually start to get rid of some labels uh, already. 
I'm not going to talk much about that. And this is actually is kind of application dependent. So this is why I'm not spending so much time on that. And you are only going to see results about those guys in the knapsack problem. So, but but our uh, our are pretty much the bottom up approach, the top down approach, and the, the coupling approach. Cool. So first, for the knapsack problem, the the important things here are the following. So first, we are solving problems with up to seven objective functions. Okay. So for the area, again, as I've mentioned at the beginning. People usually prefer to so yeah. People usually focus on problems with two or three objectives, and here we are being able to solve problems with seven. Okay, and our algorithm is actually, uh, and as you know, you will see. Well, let me actually show directly the plot. It will be easier. As you can see, our algorithm clearly dominates the the state of the art. Uh, in this case, we implemented uh, filtering, and as you can see, with filtering, uh, the algorithms get slightly better. But still, even if you ignore uh, filtering. It's clear that our results are clearly better. And uh, the interesting thing, and this will be more clear in this plot, is that we actually shine, so to say, our approach gets actually better when the number, especially uh, relatively to the previous state of the art, especially when the size of the, the Pareto frontier grows. So, of course, when the size of the Pareto frontier is small, when the problem is small, then pretty much all the algorithms perform well, of course. But that's the number of. Uh, uh, as the size of the Pareto frontier grows, then yeah, of course, at some point it gets hard for us as well because uh, because of memory. But if we can fit things in memory, then we can do better. We scale better. For the set covering and set packing problem, so those two problems, uh, well, we basically have the very similar re uh, results to both of them. And well, the, the interesting thing is that again we are we are beating the state of the art, but also super important. And let me also uh, show this in for the knapsack problem. So for the knapsack problem, we had 450 instances for uh, to solve. And as you can see here, the best performing algorithms is solving only 350. So again, the problem is not solved. Our methods. I'm, I'm trying to make the case here and say that it's that it's good, but again, it doesn't completely solve the problem. And the same thing for the set coping. So we had 150 uh, instances for the problem. And as you can see, we were able to solve about 100. And then the interesting thing is that, as you can see, we can either solve the problem quickly, and by quickly, I mean in five minutes or so, or the problem gets super, super hard, and then we just can't solve those guys anymore. And using this, uh, this plot, this cumulative plot, again, we, we have the advantage. But it's important to say that we also lose uh, sometimes here. And here we have the, the problem that, well, all the approaches based on decision diagrams face as well. We do have uh, scalability issues when the size of the decision diagrams grows way too large. So in some cases here, we were basically losing just because the, the time that, that we, it was taking for us to build the network model was huge. So in terms of finding the shortest paths, we, we do quite well, but building the network model, when the, uh, when the network model gets really, really large, then we struggle a little bit. But still, in any case, uh, even though we are losing in, in some instances, our, uh, our algorithms are, are performing quite well. So here, uh, this is pretty much a nonlinear optimization problem. Actually, our benchmark was, was huge. We had over 6,000 instances. But for the vast majority, we were able to solve the problem very, very quickly. So the, the results that I'm reporting here, they are very, they are restricted. They are, again, I'm only talking about 450 instances. And in this case, uh, as you can see, the difference is actually brutal. So here we were really able to solve pretty much everything very quickly. We, we were able to solve almost all the instances in, in 10 minutes or so. And the other methods, of course, for those harder instances, they were not uh, they were not even close. Again, because those methods are pretty much they are more focused on, on linear optimization. They do much better in, in linear optimization. But when you have nonlinear optimization, things get uh, slightly nastier. And again, for us, this is not really a problem. Again, if you, that's the nice thing of having a decision diagram uh, behind the curtain. Again, important, we lose uh, in, a, in a few cases, but again, for those problems that, that we were losing, the difference was that uh, they were taking like one second and our algorithm was taking like 10 seconds. So, okay, yeah, we, are, we were still losing, uh, a loss is a loss anyway, but as you can see, the, the results are strongly in, in, in our favor. 
And finally, for the TSP, well, the TSP is actually quite hard. So we, as I've mentioned before, this is not a binary optimization problem. This is an integer optimization problem in terms of the, the formulation. And as you can see, I will go ahead, uh, ahead to, the, uh, to the table. We actually do quite well. Of course, with five CDs, everybody does uh, quite well. With 10 CDs, then you can see that for us, things are still okay. We, we don't suffer so much. And it's important to see, to check, for instance, the third column. This is the size of the Pareto frontier. And for us, again, as you can see, we don't really struggle so much with that, whereas the premium state of the art starts to suffer as the Pareto frontier increases. Finally, super important to mention, when we have only 15 decision variables, only 15 cities, right, in the TSP, but seven objective functions, then we are pretty much that. So the previous state of the art could improve the problem, but neither could I. So again, I repeat what I said before, the multi-objective optimization is not a solved problem. Yeah, and that's basically that. So basically what I showed was a new framework to solve uh, multi-objective uh, optimization problems. It's based on network models. If you don't know what the network model is, it's pretty much a decision diagram. And this actually works pretty well because we have to, uh, after we incorporate the validity preserving operations, okay? So we saw that we were able to beat some of the, the, the other methods in the state of the art. And again, well, one of our advantages is the fact that we don't suffer so much when the Pareto frontier gets way too big. And yeah, so this work is based on two articles that have been published uh, already. And if you have questions, I'll be happy to take them. Thanks so much, Carlos. Uh, it was an excellent talk. Does anybody have, I, I do have a question from Isaac. Um, so Isaac is asking, this isn't exactly specific to this presentation, but you mentioned running tests on a single core from comparability. And I have been wondering about that aspect of the results section generally. It seems to me that one of the cool things about this is how incredibly parallelizable they are. What do you do if you have an algorithm that isn't necessarily being in the state of the art on one core, but it blows it away on several? Wonderful point. That's a wonderful question. Uh, the thing is, uh, in, in this particular, yeah, so this is actually, this, this kind of work is actually gaining more traction now, right? So now it does. So the, the Gurobi, for instance, it's a great, so Gurobi, for instance, was designed pretty much to explore uh, several threads, several cores. So yeah, this, this is a, actually a, a very fair point. The thing is, but why did I make the, the comment? Uh, when you have, um, several threads, several cores, the comparison between uh, our things gets slightly more complicated, right? So it's already complicated to compare whatever results I got from whatever results you got in your computer. If you consider just one core, if you have several different cores, well, you are not only taking into account uh, the execution time of your process, there are also other things going on, right? So this is what makes things slightly more complicated. From a computational setting, from an experimental setting, I think it's more complicated to actually make fair comparisons, especially when you're comparing your approach to other approaches that other authors have worked on. But your point is very well taken. This is actually, a, yeah, that's, that's a great point. In some cases, that actually happens. Uh, if you have, for instance, uh, several cores, you have some randomness that shows up in the process. And this can improve the performance wildly. I, I saw that uh, showing up in a few cases. So yeah, point well taken, point well taken. Alia has a question. Yes, Alia has a question. Can you elaborate a little more on how you convert back to the original solution space after you complete the reduction operations while preserving the Pareto frontier? Okay, I will elaborate a little more because uh, we really didn't focus on that on this work. So one way that you could do that is by, so for instance, that's one, one possible approach, is about once you find the solution that you actually uh, like, you can keep track of the VPOs of the, uh, the, the operations that you executed, and you can reverse back the, the network accordingly, right? So you can undo all the, the operations that you have done before. Of course, your network will, 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 will increase again. But again, if you keep track of that, well, then you actually know how to, how to find the, the path between the, this particular solution that you have and the root node. So this would be one, one way. I think that we also discussed back in the day, Andre will probably remember that better than me. I think that you can also 
kind of builds uh, MIPS and things like that to compute the, the actual solution associated with a, with a label, right, Andre? But I think yeah. the easiest way was to actually undo the, the VPOs. You can either uh, maintain uh, the set of solutions, up to, which is a lot, or you can do a map where you say that the object function of each one of the object functions has to be equal to the object function of that frontier. So it is an expensive operation. And actually, so uh, this is actually a very good question. So when we were presenting this work a few years ago, we actually had this uh, this critique, right? So one of uh, one person came up and said, "Okay, well, why do you think your comparison is fair? Because some of these other methods they are com computing everything, and they give you not only the the label, but they also give you the solution. And in our case, we are only focusing on the on the label. So yeah, it's a fair point. It's a point very well taken, but yeah." It is what it is. So that's the trade-off. Any more questions? To complement Isaac on parallelization with it is actually there is a, it is a becoming an active area. Isaac, uh, I know that uh, maybe you heard uh, Xavier Gillard. He has some parallelization in his DD solver. Um, there are some people from IBM Research that work on the deparallelizations as well. Uh, when you have the branch inbound with the DDs and you parallelize it, and there there is other there's another range of works that they do more DP based. For example, they do they use GPUs to parallelize the solution of dynamic programming models. It's a relatively recent paper on informed general computing, and you could do the same thing with DDs. Maybe there is a project for you there. Any more questions? No? Sorry, I had to miss the whole thing today, everybody, uh, but class is called. Well, we were just finishing off. Uh, so thanks so much, everybody. Uh, Dave. Let's conclude this. Um, it was a great pleasure to have you all. I've just finished the recording here.